Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to Nautel's Transmission Talk Tuesday webinar series. Tuesday this week, Wednesday next week, Wednesday last week, I'm going to need a calendar to keep track of it all. More to the point, I'm going to have to look at it. I'm your host, Jeff Welton, and we're talking about HD radio stuff today. Uh, of course, as always, I try to find somebody smarter than me, and this week I grabbed our good friend and cohort, Alex Hartman. Alex, welcome aboard. Glad to have you with us. Hey, guys. Oh, and so the, the running joke is that uh, not only am I here to uh, bring Alex in so we got somebody smarter than me, but I'm here to de-geekify the whole process a little bit, too. So hopefully that'll help. I see... Uh, couple of people in the audience that know a lot more than I do about HD radio as well. So uh, we'll be opening mics and uh, grabbing some of y'all today. Before we start, the normal housekeeping stuff. If you are an SBE member, and you definitely should be, then completion of this webinar does give you half a credit toward recertification, which reminds me I need to start filling out my recertification list sometime in the near future. Uh, so under category I of the research schedule on the fancy new SBE website, I guess it's not that new now, it's been what, five or six months, but uh, it's a really nice new website. So uh, anyway, if you're an SBE member, by all means, write this down, it's half a credit. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms, or concerns, feel free to type them into the enter question for staff box under the questions tab on your little dashboard. We'll uh, try to handle them as they come in, or if I see something come in and I know it's going to be dealt with later on in the uh, in the show, then uh, we'll hit it then. By all means, if you've got a microphone and feel like uh, opening it up and chatting with us, then uh, hit the little hand wavy icon and we'll unmute you and make you part of the conversation. Uh, Barry wants to know if we get full credit for hosting this. All I get is brownie points and public visibility. I'm not sure which is worse. Uh, but at least there's no numbers and profile pictures, so I'm going to call it a win. All right, so what we are talking about is HD radio. I called the topic HD primer, so we're going to start sort of entry level and uh, look at the basics, how it's configured. We're going to uh, talk about some of the known issues because, I mean, everybody's heard HD doesn't work, HD sounds like crap, blah, 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 this, that, and the other thing. And... Uh, what do they say? Those that say something can't be done or really tend to get in the way of those of us who are busy doing it. So uh, we'll see if we can't uh, shut a few of those down or, or at least show you how you can make the best of a bad situation because sometimes, yeah, things aren't ideal. Um, and we'll talk about other uh, cut costs, maintain quality, all that great stuff. Alex is going to talk quite a bit about installation considerations as well because uh, he, he's wearing two shirts for this. He's done this from the contract engineer inside. He's uh, got the serial number one of just about everything we've built in the past several years as a, a beta guinea pig. And uh, so he's worked at it from the university level and now he's doing tech support and gets to answer all the calls that he used to ask, which is even better. Um, so does, does that keep you up at night at all? Oh, yeah. Well, here's the thing is, you know, my daughter looks at me and says, Dad, what do you actually do all day? And I said, I talk to people who used to be like me. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or who are like you used to be, whichever way it goes. Right. So exactly. One of the big questions I get, and I'm dealing with it now with a customer, is um, a lot of folks don't know the different ways you can generate the HD signal. And so I, I put together a couple little slides. Uh, high level injection was one of the first things and a lot of the early adopters ended up doing this where you, you had a big transmitter doing analog, a little transmitter doing HD. You got a, a, a dumb combiner, usually a, a 6 dB combiner, uh, no, 10 dB combiner, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, then you dump a whole lot of power into a reject load and a whole lot of power goes up the antenna. Um, downside, you're dumping 10% of your analog power and 90% of your digital power into the uh, into the reject load. So obviously, if the reject load's inside, that's a whole different issue. You definitely want it outside. Um, I see uh, we've got uh, some folks from ERI in the audience too. So uh, they uh, they have a more efficient way of doing this. So again, options. So, you know, definitely the, the big thing to do, and I'm going to preface this whole conversation, and I say this all the time, is work with your manufacturer. And I don't care whether it's us, Gates, Air, Rodian, Swartz, BE, whoever, 
Um, but work with your manufacturer to determine what system will work best for your situation because no two scenarios are identical you know so definitely that's uh that's something to uh to look at there um william harrison gives a, a plus one for eri 788 the high efficiency hd combiner and and i see uh, bill harland's in the audience so yeah absolutely um, those are definitely a good option with a lot less waste than the original scenario. So, you know, they add, they add cost, no question about it, but if you can do it with a much smaller HD transmitter and a lot less dump power into a reject load, again, look at your particular situation and see what's more cost effective. And high level uh, is usually, uh, high level is usually, you know, the only option for channel combined sites. You know, you, a lot of them out there were never developed with HD in mind they are still in use. Yep. So you have to make sure that, you know, if you're in a channel combined situation, you work with your plant manager to make sure that you can do it correctly. Right. So and not, not only your manufacturer, but the plant manager, just the same. And that's something else that we'll get into in a little bit is looking at the peak voltage requirements is a really big concern with HD. And I say, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, next up, space combined, and we get that one a lot, and that's another situation where it can be a whole lot less costly on the power bill, so the long-term operational costs can be less. Um, downside is uh, pattern match, and you want to talk to that a little bit, Alex? Yeah, when you the the hard part isn't matching it up inside the on the tower; it's the hard part is matching it up uh, out in the uh, out in the car or the home or the moving vehicle. Um, yep. So you can you can create your own null essentially and cancel out your own signals if you're not very careful about how you're doing it and manage your expectations of that technology. Right. I mean the the short uh, description is as you go away from any FM antenna, you've got peaks and nulls as you move further away in the near field in the you know two or three kilometer diameter or a couple of miles around the tower. Mm -hmm. And if your two antennas aren't identical, which they're not going to be almost ever or mm -hmm. at least matched for opti to optimize it, then you are going to hit periods where you've got a digital null and an analog, or a digital peak rather, and an analog null, and mm -hmm. you're going to get some on your analog signal. Right. So d definitely something to be aware of. Now, having said all that, if your tower is out in a cornfield five miles out of town, for example, and you don't have any listeners anywhere nearby, and you own the tower, so you're not paying by the foot, this is a really good alternative in a lot of cases. So again, it's situational. Work with your manufacturer and see what works best for you based on what you've got and what you intend to accomplish. Right. Now, Jeff Wilson's asked if there are issues, filtering issues with space combining when the analog's into a combined antenna. And so if you got your analog into a channel combiner and then uh, wanted to put up a separate digital antenna, what, what would you want to be aware of there? Well, uh, the, the, if, if, if you put a bandpass, band reject, you know, a, a standard filter in there, obviously you can't filter yourself out of there. Uh, it's actually kind of counterintuitive because you need it there. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, uh, we, we found that uh, all the filters that are out there have a sharp roll off and they can affect the digital signal so circulators are actually a better idea in that case uh you know a three port circulator with a dummy load hanging off one, the third port uh just to keep the uh combined reject from the uh, master antenna away from the digital um right. because yes it, it, uh, antennas make uh, transmitting antennas make really good receive antennas especially when they're on the same tower well, the, the running joke is that an antenna receives as well as it transmits. So, yep. Mm. Now, so, yeah, circulator is always a, a, a best practice type of item to have in this situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Joel Epley makes the comment that one big upside to space combining is that you have a ready-to-go aux facility that's under continuous testing. And that's <laughs> true as well for high-level combined, whether you're running with the traditional 10 dB combiner with all the reject load power or, or the newer high-efficiency combiners. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, whenever you've got a separate analog and digital transmitter, you've got a fully redundant system, assuming that you've got a transmitter that lends itself to easily be switched for operating mode. Yeah, and, you don't uh, have to plumb anything. Right. 
Uh, let's see, Dave Reitner asks, if you're using high level, how good is the audio combining for analog and HD? And that's kind of, I mean, we're, we're only talking about, because we got separate transmitters, Dave, there, there is no real audio combining per se, unless, uh, unless you're asking if it adds delay. Um, uh, but either way, that would be fixed, right, Alex? Uh, it depends because you will have like if you're in that situation where your analog is on a master antenna and you got a separate antenna for or you know high level combined even and in sep interleaved antennas, yeah you can run into group delay issues um, mm -hmm. through the combiner just the same. So yes, there will be a, a you you will have a challenge chasing your delay uh, yeah. to a degree. Um, and if they're dissimilar transmitters, dissimilar exciters. Uh, say your main is a BE and and your digital is a Nautel, uh, you know the, the the timing between the two can't be exact. So the best practice right. is you know make sure that they're the same exciter, um, but at least clocking and disciplining everything to like a GPS reference is definitely a requirement. Right. And the other challenge, I guess not challenge. The other uh, advantage, if you're at least running our gear, is that we can provide group delay correction. Mm -hmm. And and we have worked with with ERI and other manufacturers before, where we'll get the S21 curves and build the group delay algorithm into the transmitter. Right. So there are options there. Yeah, um, but the, the, again, work with your manufacturer to get that out in front. Um, mm -hmm. you know, those are questions that I put on a checklist for everybody who's considering an HD system: is what do you have? What are you going to do? Is that going to be retired? Are you replacing it? So on and so forth. Uh, yeah. So you know where the vendor can point you in the right direction to make the best possible uh, yeah. outcome for you. Right. And so Shane Tobin makes a comment. And uh, Shane, I'm going to put you on the payroll at some point uh, or at the very least uh, find some kind of swag kit. But uh, the Shane should uh, says uh, digital should sound identical for a given bitrate configuration. Analog will certainly vary depending on a number of factors. And this is the part where we unmute Shane's microphone and say, what factors were those? So those factors would be things like your exciter design. Uh, for instance, like a uh, you know a BEFX50 is not going to sound the same as oh, say insert random older exciter here from uh, some dinosaur transmitter. Um, and the other thing, I mean, your STL will make a big difference if you're still for some, if you're still using composite to feed your exciter versus uh, if you have a nice new digital path out to your facility, um, that's mm -hmm. certainly gonna, uh, gonna cause a, a difference in the way the analog sounds. Um, you know, but yeah, I've found that uh, there can be a wide variety of things that impact the analog sound. But the digital, as long as the processing is the same and as long as the bitrate configuration is the same, should sound the same regardless of transmitter. Now, the right. quality of reception on that digital may vary depending on your antenna configuration and so on. Uh, but right. uh, as far as the audio quality, it should be identical. Yeah. Now, uh, Dave makes a, a little clarification. His point is, isn't it uh, easier for a low level and high level? And and absolutely, when everything's being amplified through the same box, with the caveat that we'll get to in a moment, uh, this would be as good a place as any. Uh, Alex and I had a, a little discussion earlier about processing. And yep. if you run your analog through a processor and your HD1 through a different processor, then you're potentially creating issues. Very much so, uh, because the processing chains know nothing of each other in respect to timing control. So something as simple as AGC release time uh, in one processor versus the other, or just the fact that the FM has a clipper component where the digital does not, uh, will add time. And that timing could be variable. It's not always fixed uh, on a given processor. So you could be sitting there chasing that time alignment forever. Um, cause it'll catch up, you know, and the target window for matching that is, uh, three plus or minus three samples, which ends up being like 62 nanoseconds or something like that. It's a right. really tight timing system. Yeah. And the funny thing, and, uh, Philip, uh, Schmidt mentioned this in a conversation uh, a little while ago, anybody who's never had a chance to talk to Philip when it comes to moving bits from over there to over there, he's, he's pretty, pretty good at it. Um, but uh, the unique thing is that your gold standard is three samples or better. The space between three and 50-ish samples is where things rapidly fall apart. And then as you go past that, they get better again. 
Yeah. So yep. it's really kind of interesting that sometimes if you got to choose, you're better off going for worse than sort of okay. Yep. Uh -huh. Because the audio will actually create a null when it transitions from analog to digital, and it, that's where you get that whoop, the audio drops out for that split second while it moves. Right. And so moving forward, the and and this segues into um, what Dave Reitner was asking about it uh, being easier for low level than high level. And so low level is low level combining is when you put both audio signals into a single box, single transmitter. It uh, amplifies them, sends them up a single line to a single antenna. Everything's good. Um, you do have, and this is what we're talking about with the audio clocking, where the ideal would be to use a processor that's designed for HD and does the analog and the HD one in the same box so that the clocking is common to both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you may want to run a clock signal in there, and that's uh, something else that we'll get to when we talk about uh, best practices later on. But uh, overall, this is the simplest configuration because it's got the fewest number of moving or unmoving pieces. Um, mm -hmm. However, it does require a bigger box. And you know, if you've got a fairly new or really good, healthy uh, analog transmitter right now, this can be, especially at the higher TPOs, if you're up into the class Bs or Cs, it, it can be pricey. You know, now the sales guy says, hey, buy the bigger box, buy the bigger box. Mm -hmm. But it's, again, it's situational it's not always the best solution so definitely work with your manufacturer um, we've improved a lot uh, these days at 14 dbc injection i'm going to do better than most not all but most analog tube rigs so on efficiency so and, you know. and remember if you can do the minus 10 which you know is the max you can do for hd injection right now in the united states and i believe canada as well um, because they kind of follow along. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, that could mean that you need a 40 kilowatt box for 22 kilowatts of analog power. So right. keep that in mind. You need a lot of overhead to go that high in digital. Yeah. And we will talk about that a little bit further down the line, too, because that is critical for sizing a whole bunch of things, not just the transmitter. Um, let's see, high level combining methods, we have to use two transmitters with the same power and 90% of the digital power goes to the reject load. Lucio, that is exactly correct. We, we mentioned that a bit ago and uh, definitely if you're not using one of the newer high efficiency combiners and uh, ERI is uh, I think 788 series, I believe, is the, the one that comes to mind. But uh, but yeah, if you're running high level with the older 10 dB I call them dumb hybrid system that got pretty spendy on the amount of electricity you're dumping into a reject load. Um, you're paying a lot to contribute to heating uh, the outdoors. Uh, one of the other things that doesn't get a lot of press because it's again for the average station, not a situation, but if you're running into a channel combiner, I see I should uh, replace my GV picture. That's about as fuzzy as you could possibly get. But, uh, if you're running into a channel combiner, it is a possibility in some cases that you can backfeed the digital transmitter into the reject load port yes, and you can. Uh, do, do your combining that way. Uh, the big challenge there, and you really, really need to work closely with your combiner manufacturer on this, the big challenge tends to be the power rating of the reject load port. And mm -hmm. uh, I've seen what happens when you dump a kilowatt and change in backfit into a reject load port that's rated for a kilowatt and no change. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't take long for things to get ugly. So again, situational work with the manufacturers. So Alex, thoughts on that? Yeah. I know uh, that's just, not something you've messed with a whole lot. Well, no, you've been down to... I, or, yep, yep. We, we've done that in a couple different places around here. Um, and a couple other projects now that with Nautel, uh, where this is come into play several places around the world in, in testing. Um, yes, it is imperative you know exactly how that uh, wideband uh, reject port is characterized even. Um, you know, if, if it's done something differently, you might have to do pre-EQ correction and curve correction prior to even shoving it in there uh, from the transmitter. So you have to be a very careful if you're gonna do backfeed. And remember, it is still a reject. Something goes wrong down the line on the combiner guess what's taking the brunt of it yep 
Right. And, and the other challenge is with a situation like this, I guess it wouldn't matter whether you were running a hybrid box into the main port of a channel combiner or running backfit into a uh, reject port. If something goes wrong with the combiner, you're probably taking the whole station down anyway. Right, right. So things that begin, to, you know, you know the risks when you're working with these types of systems. You right. Know, make sure that your manufacturers are up front with you. And it's like, okay, you can do this, but right um, you know, ask the caveat there, questions there are other factors that come into play here that we'll talk about in a little bit too uh relating to the peak to average power ratio where hybrid sometimes gives you an advantage with uh better well with uh what a, one of our competitors i think calls it crest factor reduction we call it papr but whatever you call it the uh, that can also play come into play so it's something to be Very aware so. of uh, the other thing to think about is bandwidth, and everybody is always all HDs, terrible bandwidth, and you know they they say 121 kilobits and they see MP3. Well, mm -hmm. this is not your audio codec MP3, so you know we're we're not talking apples and uh, oranges here. It's more like apples and pomegranates or something like that. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, MP1 and MP3 at the moment are the most common. Also, we're or, yeah, it's also we're starting to see a few yep. MP11s. Yeah. So the the MP1 was the original mode. That was the the first iteration of digital that came out in North America in HD. From uh, back then, it was Ubiquity. Uh, now it's Xperia, um, and that was you know the the standard 97 kilobits. Uh, of data that you are, you're allocated. So your HD1 could take all 97 uh, if you wanted to with no subchannels. Uh, and that included, uh, I, I think that included the metadata in that partition as well. So you could do artist and title pad data, PSD yep. then. Um, so those those things are applicable here. And, and then, uh, you know, we, we got a little bit more clever and MP3 mode came along and I, I, I call it, you know, music partition is what I <laughs> equate the MP to, um, because there are different slices here. And, and so there, in MP1, there's one partition, as you can see in the graphic. MP3 actually is a misnomer because it's technically three partitions, but it's only two. Um, so you have your original 97 kilobits with an additional 24 kilobits. Uh, so you get that extra channel there. 24 kilobits is with the HD audio codec as low as I would suggest for anything music. Um, so it, it, it's perfectly fine to run a, a, a parametric stereo audio channel on. Um, yeah. Perfectly now, fine. It will, that, uh, but I wouldn't so, go any lower than that. All right. So, and now, if you want to run an HD4, this is the mode you pretty much have to run. Uh, you're not doing HD4 Correct. in MP1 mode. Uh, I have Correct. heard, and, and that's the other thing to keep in mind, that HD1 does have a minimum bandwidth setting. So you're basically Correct. chopping up the rest of your bandwidth between your two, three, and if you've got one, your four. Right, and I think the current way that it's written is the lowest you can do on your HD1 is 48, I want to say. Uh, no, it's, I believe it's down to 36 now. Shane, uh, if you're... 36. Uh, if you're still paying attention, jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's 36 now. I'm not seeing Shane jumping in to correct me. Mm -hmm. Oh, cor correct. Cortect. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to yep. ding yeah, you too hard on spelling. It, but... it went from 64 to 48. Now it's 36. So the lowest you can do is 36. And to me, that's and, getting pretty dangerously low. Well, and the advantage is, I mean, with the with proper perceptual coding, that can sound pretty good. The challenge is that a lot of stations are not necessarily no. using, and we'll talk about that in a bit when we get mm -hmm. to the uh, to the audio portion. Right. But uh, yeah, there are a lot of things that can be done. Um, I was at a site down in the southwest many years ago, back when I was wearing your shirt. Actually, I guess I am wearing your shirt, but uh, <laughs> the the tech support version of it. And uh, the orange ones upstairs. I, there you go. And I, I was at a site and they were running uh, long form classical music at 24 kbps. And on a Bose receiver, you could, on the like, if you had a single high frequency sustain note, like on a flute solo or something, you could hear the artifacts. Yeah. But beyond that, now they were running a really good perceptual codec, uh, one of the ones that went away. Uh, 
the What's new up, stars man? probably thank you very much yes i have one and, sitting right uh, there <laughs> uh, figures, of course you do but uh and, and brad humphrey says even at that it still sounds better than sirius xm that's it seems to be a, a uniquely American thing because SXM up here actually sounds a lot better. I won't listen to it in a rental car, but in my truck, I will. Go figure. Weird. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, so the Kodak is huge. And how you right. uh, how you massage it and process for it is also huge. And we'll we'll spend some time about right. that in a second. But, and then the new thing, on the, the new kid on the block is that MP11 mode uh, that yes. just recently released by Xperi, which adds yet another 24 kilobit channel to the end. And if you notice in the graphic there, look which way it's going. It's not going out to the edges, it's going in. Mm -hmm. uh, so be careful of knowing that, uh, you know, if, if you drive, if you drive your analog hard, you will start running into the uh, digital portion there. Right. Um, so if you're doing 110, 112% modulation, you can impact digital performance uh, just well, by the, simply over modulating. The other thing to be aware of is as you add the um, additional carriers, as you go from MP1 to MP3 to MP11, you start to get into your SCA frequencies and your RDS. Yes. Not, not quite to the RDS, but you are. Nope. So it, basically, 92 is you, unusable even in mp1 mode in mp1 and, mode and now you're encroaching on the 67. right and and that's something to be aware of if you do run something like a an sca service like a reading service or something that uh, hd may be something that again talk to your manufacturer and make sure you let them know what you're running before you uh, start uh, firing this stuff up because mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing worse than an unpleasant surprise well no there is so this is the one where you um, run a digital only transmitter into a antenna and say, well, I'm only putting a kilowatt of digital power up there. This one kilowatt rated antenna will be fine, right? <laughs> and the Nine short answer is the one. Yeah. So basically you've got a nominal and we're all familiar with peak power calculations. Of course, peak power being four times uh, RMS power nominally. Uh, so that is a good rule of thumb. Now, obviously, depending on the peak to average power reduction algorithm you're using, and in the uh, the latest version of the expiry code, and we've been doing something similar, maybe even a hair better with our HD power boost since the GV series came out and a little before, so several years now. Um, it's actually less than that. It, it's closer, like you say, four or five dB, give or take. Yep. But uh, if you use six dB as your rule of thumb for calculating your peak power, so you take your analog TPO, say it's 100 kilowatts. Well, if you want to run 10% of that, that's 10 kilowatts. Assume that your digital power is going to have that four or six dB peak to average ratio and allow for 40 kilowatts. 140 kilowatts total power is what you want your antenna and all the components rated for. Yep. And, you know, that's the uh, that's the thing to remember. So, uh, you know, what do you think, what comments do you have on that? Yeah, um, ha having experienced that firsthand uh, where someone has turned on a digital only transmitter into an antenna going, hey, the, the antenna is rated for, you know, two and a half kilowatts input and we're going to run, you know, 1300 watts great they call me up a week later the line burnt well, up and the antenna why is it melting <laughs> why is it melting what's all these visuars trips uh, what, what's going on here and i'm like well you didn't account for the fact that digital is ones and zeros on or off peaks mm -hmm. um you know it, so it, it, it takes a lot more power handling to deal with it uh yeah. again goes back to the channel combiner stuff just the same you know, if your channel combiner was made for a 20 kilowatt input, it better be able to handle 60 kilowatt if you're doing HD through it. Right. Uh, just because. So those are the considerations. And everybody who's ever had to deal with a channel combiner of a 20 kilowatt to a 60 kilowatt upgrade is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, because they are not small. Um, I'm pretty sure the guys at ERI can make them smaller than a bus these days, but they are still quite large. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm just not because peak voltage. If you see me looking away, I'm taking some notes on some things that Shane said that I know will come up later, and I want to be sure to make sure to ask him at that point. At the right. appropriate point, Shane, we'll be bringing you back. Oh, right. Um, so so those are the very big considerations, and this is also 
Uh, the new kid, the other new kid on the block besides MP11 is MA3, all digital AM. Yep. Same rule applies. Uh, you can have up to 10 dB peaks on the AM side. So mm -hmm. if you think you're going to do three kilowatts of carrier power, your, your, your peak power forward out of that transmitter is going to be some closer to 20. Yep. So the transmitter needs to be sized again for what you're doing. And, and this is part of the reason too, that on, on the analog or on the AM rather, and, and we did do a, uh, an MA3 session last week. So that's archived. I'll, I'll focus on FM this week, but just bring that up. Definitely. That's one of the reasons they changed the measurement method and yep. brought back the thermocouple am ammeter, which we discussed last week. Had well, nice they're, picture they're, they're, treating AM, they're treating AM a lot more like they should have. Uh, and Phil Schmidt put this in the comments for it was uh, it's like digital television. Same mm -hmm. thing. Yep. Well, Same with running got... an IBOC only transmitter. It's a digital TV signal. So got those guys who have right. TV sites should be very familiar with this. Yep. And, and I mean, when you get right down to it these days, I mean, the in FM, the digital carriers are amplitude modulated onto the uh, phase module or the frequency modulated carrier. On uh, hybrid AM, the uh, digital carriers are phase modulated onto the amplitude modulated carrier. So either direction, we've got an AM and a PM component in uh, both signals, which is, is really kind of cool. And you do have to make some allowances for that. And on uh, one real quick thing about the power requirements, if you are still running, uh, what do you, you call that, Jeff? Uh, hollow state technology? Glass uh, FETs, yeah. Yeah, glass FETs. Um, remember that the the am noise can change this as well because you end up with that synchronous am noise coming from the tube as it as it starts to age will mm -hmm. affect those peaks just the same yeah oh dave reitner asks can you use an fm antenna for hd use and the short answer for that dave is sort of usually mostly yes um, it depends <laughs> well yeah so you've got to look at all this peak power stuff that we're talking about here to make sure that the antenna is rated for it if you've got an older antenna back in the day and i know eri did it i, I should probably uh i saw it would be a great example of this well the, there's a bunch of them the old rcas the phelps dodge some of the old harris antennas were slope tuned mm -hmm. so uh and basically what that meant, they they find the sweet spot, the, the perfectly tuned spot, and then they purposely detuned it a little so that as the antenna iced up, it went through the perfectly tuned spot down the other side. So you had longer that you could run before the SWR became an issue. Mm -hmm. For HD, you can't do that. You need a symmetrical load. Um, otherwise, the performance isn't going to be as good. And yep, uh, we'll talk pass. about why in a bit with the MER. Yep, so, and band pass. So right, band remember those carriers are in the, those 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 carriers are on the outside of the analog. So if your right. your antenna is only designed to pass 200 kilohertz, you're so pushing it. that's and, and again for the most part that's not an issue if you're running and and I, I keep picking on ERI but that's because I saw Bill in the uh, the audience and uh, and I know most of their products. So uh, but if you're running a rototiller. As a rule, unless you've got a lot of parasitics on it for a highly directional pattern, it'll work just fine. Yeah. All right. You may want to sweep it. Actually, you definitely should sweep it to make sure that it's tuned right on your frequency. But mm -hmm. beyond that, shouldn't be an issue. Um, definitely, right. if you get a consulting engineer out to run a, a network analyzer or just a, a, a frequency sweep on it, they should be able to tell you pretty quick what it looks like. Um, you could do that right at the transmitter output, and at that point, you're also looking at any channel combiners, filters, notches, et cetera, and so on that you've got in the line. But uh, bandwidth does matter. And uh, that's the same. We beat that drum really bad for the AM because, of course, with the AM, a couple of kilohertz of bandwidth relative to carrier is a really big deal. For mm -hmm. FM, less so because the ratio between the two is so much. So, right. you know, it, it's uh, it's not as much a concern. But, yeah, you want to be aware of it. And also be aware of it, not necessarily combined site, but multi-tenant sites where, you know, everybody's, you know, got their own antennas type of thing. You need to know what you're in for just the yeah. same. Well, and that's something else. Uh, Shively, we did a, uh, I had uh, Sean Edwards from Shively was on right before Christmas and uh, put the formula. So if you go back and uh, look for that uh, TTT session, the archives, um, we put up the formula for calculating uh, isolation between antennas on a tower. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, knowing your isolation will go a long way toward telling you whether you need to add any additional filtering. Because mm -hmm. especially if you're running separate transmitters, remember that your digital transmitter is little, little bitty, and it's on the same frequency as your analog. So you may need isolation between those two, but you also may need isolation between the digital box and the antenna that's 25 feet above it for mm -hmm. the totally different station. So yeah, definitely things to be aware of. Right. I mean, here in Shoreview, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Brandon, uh, you know Brandon, uh, Monroe at iHeart, uh, they've got uh, a separate weird nine bay antenna right below the master antenna, you know, 100 kilowatt station sitting next to, a, I think it's 13 channels into that combiner. So mm -hmm. some serious peak power coming through that antenna. Um, right. And they're not that far away from each other. And their loads get warm, really, really warm. The reject loads mm -hmm. coming back down the line. So the Yep. things to consider if you have multi-tenant right and um, lucio asks what about the performance of the unipole antenna and hybrid am and typically lucio those should be okay the bandwidth is not bad it depends a lot because a lot of them have a simple l network which won't give you proper phase rotation um, so you need to look at more than just the antenna in that case you need to look at the tuning unit if you've got an L network, you may need to upgrade it to a T network to give you enough control over the phase rotation because an L network will only rotate 90 degrees. So um, so definitely there are some things. If uh, Lucio, if you go back and look in our archives, last week we did an MA3 AM, all digital AM uh, presentation. And uh, a lot of those, uh, that detail will apply equally well to hybrid AM. Um, mm -hmm. Especially where hybrid AM has got such a wide bandwidth requirement, the spec is 1.4 to 1 SWR at plus or minus 15 kilohertz. So, so you do need to be aware of that. All right, moving forward. So coverage, we talked about this before. You said you can do minus 10. And it again, it depends a lot. And mm -hmm. what I tell folks is, what's your market? I mean, where are you and what do you want to accomplish? If you are covering a small town in a rural area, 14 dB is going to give you city grade coverage, a good solid HD coverage out to your city grade contour. You probably don't need to run any more than that. Um, well, if and you, I'll, 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 pre I'll, I'll throw something in there too. It, it, terrain matters. If you're in flyover country in the central US, 14 dB will actually most likely get out to your uh, 54 dBU. It'll go beyond your city grade. Yeah. Um, but if you're in the mountains of Colorado, 60 is probably pushing good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, again, market, where you're located, what you want to accomplish. Uh, so the general rule of thumb for what it's worth is that uh, everybody can do minus 14 except for the couple of dozen grandfathered uh, super Bs, the super powered class Bs, who are limited to minus 20. Um, beyond minus 14, it requires a, a DU desired or undesired, uh, basically a, an interference contour study to make sure that your 54 is not stepping on anybody else's 60. Uh, 54, 50 contour, sorry, my bad. Um, so you need to have a consultant run that study. We do have a tool on our website. If you have a Nautel users group login, if you don't, anybody can sign up for one. You don't need to be a Nautel user. We probably should change that acronym sometime. I know Matt's listening in the background. So Matt, take a note, change NUG to, uh, hey guys, anybody can join. I don't know what you call it, but uh, <laughs> There is a calculator there that uh, the folks at Cavell and Mertz provided. And uh, keep in mind that it, it's not updated on a regular basis. It's only meant to be a guideline, but it will give you a general working idea on who may or may not be in your area that, that could potentially be a problem with going above minus 14. Right. Um, at that point, you can decide if you need to pay a consultant a couple of grand to come in and do the actual study and, and rate the application to, to increase power. Right. Um, now, the other thing is asymmetry, because you may have somebody on this side, but be good on the other side, in which or case... on the you, bottom or top of the band. Right. So, well, if you're on the bottom, you're okay. You can you can go to minus 10 if you're on 88.1. We already discussed that in a different conversation. Mm -hmm. But uh, but absolutely, the uh, asymmetry is still treated as an experimental license. So that's, again, a different application and something to be aware of. 
Um, Matt's put a link to the RF toolkit in on the uh, chat section. So if you see a little uh, chat window or chat bubble blinking away, that's why. Thank you, Matt. See, this is why we like Matt so much because he throws in all these helpful links and uh, critical comments while we're uh, while we're going. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, definitely figure out what you want to do. Um, there are going to be some situations where minus ten is what you want to accomplish. Oh, then and there there are numbers in between minus fourteen, minus twenty, and minus yep. ten, just the same. You, you know, I've got a site that can run. Uh, minus 13, for instance, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or or minus 17 uh, right. for just a little bit more because that's what their transmitters all it's capable of while still maintaining their analog TPO. Fine, right. they can take it. And Doug Rosequist has asked for clarification on on what we're talking about with all these numbers. So that's that's a really good question. Yep. So what we're looking at is dB relative to carriers. So it's actually dBc. And it's uh, so minus 10 dBc is your digital power is 10% of your analog power or, or minus 10 dB. Um, minus 20 dB, you just move the decimal over, so now it's 1%. And then the other numbers are so 3 dB or 6 dB below minus 10 is uh, a quarter, so minus 14 is 4%. Um, that's my incredibly that's terrible. If if I had a pencil and a piece of paper, I could sketch it faster and I can right. explain it. But, but that's what you're looking at is dB relative to your analog carrier. Yep. And, and uh, nothing's so higher than 10. Right. So minus 14, my general rule of thumb is minus 20 is useless. It's what everybody started with. It's good to drive a translator, but uh, somebody will be complaining about the HD dropping out. Um, again, though, depending where you are, if you've got the height and the terrain, it could work. Right, exactly. Um, there, there's those things like here again, Minnesota. You know, our elevation changes 20 feet over 200 miles, <laughs> so it, it, it's relatively flat. But you know, on the Shoreview Tower at, at 1,300 feet, minus 20 will get you 70 miles. Ways. Right, and again, remembering that the bulk of the receivers at this point anyway are in cars, so you don't have to right. worry as much about building penetration. Right. So something to think about there. Um, so, like I said, minus 20, if you only want to drive a translator and don't care about the coverage, that's the way to go. It's the cheapest. Um, all of our transmitters will do faceplate power. All of our current transmitters will do faceplate power at minus 20 dB of HD injection. So you don't have to think about down or upsizing for, uh, for the higher power requirements either. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get up to minus 14, we can do 90% of face plates. So a 10 kilowatt will do nine kilowatts of analog power plus minus 14 dBC of HD. Um, when you get to minus 10, as Alex said earlier, that's a much bigger difference. I think a 10 kilowatt will do six kilowatts at minus 10. Is that right? Sounds right. Yeah. I think it's 60%. It's a, yeah. and again, the spec sheets are on the website. I'm, you know, I'm not going to regurgitate stuff that you can look up pretty easily. And this is where but it comes I, back to where you might need a 40 for 22 kilowatts if you want to try right. and run minus 10. And you will get that much overhead. Absolutely. And and so this is the where it becomes a big deal. If I've got a seven and a half kilowatt TPO to make a 25 kilowatt radiated power then I can do minus 14 all day long with a 10 kilowatt transmitter. If I want to go to minus 10, then I'm bumping up to a 15 or a 20 kilowatt transmitter. And that is, you know, it, it raises the price of the project. So definitely sometimes you have to compromise and it's something to be aware of. The other yep. thing is that in between the two, of course, we've got the asymmetric uh, solutions where if you can't raise one sideband, you can raise the other and potentially lock in receivers further away than you could at if both sides were lower. Right. So, now, do you have anybody running asymmetry at the moment, Alex? Uh, no. Well, I guess not you do because you, well, I do. When, you got, <laughs> when you got Nautel as your uh, customer base, but. Right. But yeah, um, I mean, yeah. But I, I did have one uh, for testing a couple of years ago for the college here uh, at the university. Mm -hmm. um, just to study, uh, because back then, uh, this college station's on 88.1. Uh, several years ago, it was, I couldn't go to minus 10. I was clear on, I was clear to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. But the uh, rules prohibit it because technically channel at six. minus 10, I'd fall out of band and hit channel six. Yeah. Right. So those rules had to be addressed. And I believe they were uh, not too long ago. 
Um, so now that that's perfectly fine to do as long as you have your uh, STA paperwork filed with the commission so you can actually do it. Um, right. But that, at that point it was minus 14 on one side, minus 10 on the other, just to prove the point. Yeah, uh, Shane, we are going to get you to open your mic up again because he made the uh, the point that uh, that uh, he's running minus 14, minus 10 in Sacramento and it makes a measurable difference. Um, oh, Mike Martin down in uh, Winona, not too far south of you, is uh, running okay. 10 and 14 as well at KQAL. I forgot about that. Oh. Thanks. Hey, Mike, welcome aboard. Hi, so Shane, you said that uh, 14, 10 in Sacramento makes a measurable difference. Tell me. And Shane's looking for his mute button. I'm not even sure. Maybe Matt muted him when I wasn't looking. Mm. Oh, no, Shane is on a phone call. Click to send their pin. I have no idea what we've done here. Um, <laughs> we, we sent Shane an audio pin. We'll see what happens there. Um, let's see, Mike, do you have a microphone that you can uh, unmute for a second? Because I know you've just had yours up for a little while now. So it'd be uh, interesting to... Uh, to hear Winona, Winona is one yeah. of the odd parts of Minnesota where there's actually uh, some terrain to work with. Well, yeah, yeah we down on the bluffs. Lots, and lots of yep. hills around here, that's for sure. Yep. So, uh, so how do you find the minus 10, minus 14? How, how does it cover? It's we're getting really good coverage. I'm I'm very impressed with it. Um, but and more so, you know, going up and down all the little valleys around here too. It hangs in where. When we were analog, you know, there'd be a lot of multipath, but the digital just hangs right in there. I'm very surprised. Yeah, yeah, it makes a good difference. Uh, have you, have you, Mike? Have you done drive tests with uh, running symmetrical yet, just to see the differences? Uh, no, I have not. Okay. And that's something that you could pretty easily put a preset for both, and then just switch back and forth to. Uh, yep. So you you could almost do that over the over the over a phone connection. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be curious to see, especially down there in the bluffs there, how uh, how much that is actually impacting. But I would imagine it's actually quite a bit. That 6% of power is a lot uh, because the receivers are going to grab on to what it finds first and hold on for dear life. Yeah. Um, something to be, the, since this is a primer, a lot of people assume that the two carriers are a combined carrier. You know, each one's carrying half the data. No, as a matter of fact, they are redundant of each other for diversity right. and, and interleaved as well and interleaved so you can you know if, if the receiver gets you know it loses some coverage on the upper sideband for some reason uh it'll switch to the lower sideband and pick up its data there right um, well, shane's back and uh he, he's actually written a report on the 1014 so shane tell me a little bit about that right so uh we had, we had uh, authentic, uh experimental authorization for one of our stations here in the local uh, sacramento market to do minus 10 minus 14. couldn't do minus 10 on both because there was a you know a station on the other side that uh, we would be interfering with so we did minus 10 minus 14. um we had some problems uh, prior to that when we were running symmetrical uh down in the sacramento area we couldn't quite get into the you know the sacramento metro with reliable hd coverage there were some spots where it would uh, you know where it would start to drop out and likewise further north in one of the suburbs toward the north we couldn't get reliable hd coverage up there so with the minus 10 minus 14 it filled in a good number of those uh, of those gaps that we couldn't uh, that we didn't have coverage in before uh solid coverage and uh, I drove it. Uh, I drove it both ways. And uh, we actually, uh, <laughs> I had my uh, my partner in crime, Andrea, along, and she actually was. I, the method was the method I used for for uh, plotting this was pretty simple. Actually, I just tuned my truck radio to like an HD two, so I could tell when it dropped out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I had her plot on the uh, in an app on the map every single time it dropped out, and we could see where those dropouts were. So we did one run uh, at minus 10, minus 14. We did one run at uh, just asymmetrical or just symmetrical at minus 14. And uh, boy, the difference was astounding. It was, mm -hmm. um, it surprised me. Now, the other thing to be aware of too is that the HD2 carriers tend to be lower than the HD1 carriers. So you, you would tend to lose them faster than the, than the blend to analog on an HD1. Right, which is why I want another reason why I wanted to choose them. I didn't want to go so far as the HD3 because I know those are the most fragile of the bunch. But um, yeah. HD2 was was a perfect way to just kind of drive around and test this. So, yep, very cool. 
Now, I'm, Shane, I'm going to get you to stay unmuted for a second because we're going to flick over to the next slide and talk about MER. And you had made a comment about heavy analog. In, and, and in a second, I'll, I'll talk about what MER is too. I, I kind of put these slides backwards, but uh, there's a method to my madness. Wow, that's a perfect segue. And uh, in fact, yeah, um, there is a link between uh, MER and coverage. And this was the other thing that surprised me. So that same transmitter, we, um, you know, I went in and set it from uh, efficiency mode to MER priority. And oh my goodness, to watch the MER on those middle sidebands come up was just shocking. I mean, it gained me like, what would you say, Alex? It was like at least a good 3 dB or more. Oh yeah, um, yeah it pushed it right through the roof. Yeah, I mean, I was I was getting, I mean, previously it was down in the, almost the single digits in some of those center sidebands. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but, but you were getting closer to 14 to 17 dB MER when yep. you change that. So it's pretty exactly. high. Exactly. Like exactly. a 9 to a 14 is a big jump. So um, and the other thing I noticed, of course, is that, I mean, we, we modulate uh, pretty much, you know, right out to 75 kilohertz. <laughs> and it's pretty it's pretty dense. Um, you know, it's it's a 9, so it still sounds reasonably okay. Actually, it sounds pretty good, but... <laughs> Anyway, my point of that is if you uh, if you uh, if you modulate really heavily and intentionally kind of start over modulating, it'll start creeping into those middle sidebands, which will decrease your MER. So you want to make pay attention to your modulation, make sure your modulation is legal. Um, right. And now I'm going to flick ahead a little here. And, and I mentioned and uh, the, the apologies to ERI for linking them with a picture of my icebound Shively antenna. Um, but uh, the point being that overall tuning, whether it's detuned because of ice or whether you've got a good company providing you with a, a decent bandwidth channel combiner, um, mm -hmm. the tuning similar to AM, the tuning and the bandwidth make all the difference in MER. And, uh, and again, as Shane said, the, the uh, audio density. Uh, one of the questions we got last week in the talking about this for the AM was what is MER? So uh, Alex, do you want to hit that or do you want me to hit it? You go for it, buddy. All right. So MER is modulation error ratio. Now, for every carrier, there will be four spots on the constellation on a quadrature diagram where the ideal point for that carrier to land would be with respect to the, the XY. When you've got infinite MER, then you're going to have dots. That'd be your ideal perfect world. All your carriers hit exactly where they're supposed to land. So what you're looking at on the constellation, the lower left picture, is the deviation between that ideal spot and where the carrier actually did hit on the vector analysis. And uh, that's that's it in a really big nutshell. It, it's how far you are from where you really should be. Um, the worse it is, it uh, any of the TV folks will know that uh, when MER goes down, coverage goes down, and it's a very direct correlation. Um, and you want and those it, points to look a lot more like you know the, what you see here. If you have what uh, we lovingly refer in the lab as a snow globe, you've got problems. <laughs> Yeah, or even if you've got fuzzy dots, because mm -hmm. that means, again, that they're not hitting where they're supposed to. Right. Um, it should look like a fairly tightly packed triangle when you've mm -hmm. got all your carriers thrown in there at once. Right, because um, each one, each section should be a 90 degree right. section like this. Exactly, and, and you can see like uh, we've got, uh, in this particular scenario, we've got an MER of 23.48 for this particular carrier, and we're only looking at one carrier for this. Mm -hmm. And and you can look at them as an aggregate, or you can look at them individually. So uh, mm -hmm. that's, uh, it, it's a really powerful tool. This is, uh, um, Dave Doherty asks, how's this screen accessed in the AUI? And uh, Dave, if you go into the AUI menu, um, uh, X quick. out one of the X out any of the four things over to the left doesn't matter which one, and then uh, click on the little gear icon that'll show up in the middle of that blank space. Uh, select constellation, and that's what you'll be looking at. And initially, it will show you just the uh, the, the constellation quadrature there, the the, the mm -hmm. dots. If you want to get to the screen you see here, uh, click the uh, up arrow uh, icon on there, and it'll take you into the detail view. So it you know explodes the view up on the full screen, just like you right. would with the spectrum analyzer. 
Yeah, and the other caveat, if you haven't been doing your software updates on a regular basis, you may not even have the detailed uh, mm. functionality. You may just have the constellation. Update your software. Um, now, Dave, I know Dave from years gone by, and I'm pretty sure that if he's maintaining mm. something, the software is pretty current, but uh, that's always a plug. Mm. This is one of the things that I tell folks. We do, we add features and do, um, do actual reliability improvements with software updates now, as opposed to sending you a bag of uh, resistors, capacitors, and a sheet of instructions to tell you to cut the track here and then jumper this over to there. You know, all that stuff is done with software now. So uh, pay attention to the release notes before you just arbitrarily decide you don't want to do an update because it's working okay now. Um, <laughs> Let's see, we have a, oh, there you go. Paul Paul says, uh, Paul with uh, ECB in Wisconsin mentions uh, one of their guys and, and Mike is really good about keeping track of software on everything. So, mm. uh, yep, uh, everybody needs a mic. Um, let's see, uh, Shane Tobin, I found out the difference a software update can make when a VS two and a half went from dead to perfect. Yeah. Funny how stuff like that'll happen. Right. Um, I, I think we probably, I just arbitrarily leave you unmuted anymore. So you can always uh, unmute yourself and just butt right in. Um, <laughs> it, I've got kids, so I'm used to it. So right. <laughs> well, I could tell you the story quick if you'd like. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so I had, we pulled a VS 2.5 off the shelf. It was going to be sent out to a site that, uh, you know, it was actually somebody else's site, that, but we were rebroadcasting the HD. Uh, but we need to get their HD back on the air. So I was going to send them this VS 2.5. Well, I go to set it up and it refuses to ramp up to power. It is not doing anything. It is just, it is just a very unhappy box. Mm -hmm. I look at the software version that it's running. It was like probably one of the early versions that was originally released. <laughs> like I, I don't even remember the version, but I went and I, how is that even possible? <laughs> so... <laughs> So I download the latest version from uh, from Nautel. I load it up on the box, do the full OS recovery thing, and it, it comes up. It's happy as can be. <laughs> it started doing its automagical adjustments, and uh, life was good. Sometimes it matters. Now, before you go, one of the other things you had mentioned earlier that I uh, wrote a note about was I, I just wrote down processing. And... Uh, this looks like a good place to to put that. Now I know Alex likes to adjust everything to eleven all the time, but not always. Uh, <laughs> so so Shane, what what were you talking about there? So uh, I think in that one I was talking about uh, you do not want to process your HD like you would your FM. Uh, no. You definitely want a box that has a separate HD pass, one that does not do clipping. Um, if you're trying to just pass along, uh, you know, just any arbitrary output that has the same FM processing on it to your HD, it's not going to sound great. Um, in fact, it'll probably sound pretty bad because uh, perceptual codecs hate clipping on their inputs. Mm -hmm. So, um, so keep that in mind, whether it's, you know, um, even if you do have to use two separate processors, make sure the one for HD is one actually designed for HD, or at the very least one that doesn't apply clipping. Yeah, and we'll, we'll uh, debate that in a second and a half. But uh, one of the other things, and you mentioned this, and this is critical, make sure that your HD processor is one that has perceptual coding for low bit rate audio. So what I tell folks is that, especially on the HD2 and HD3, I would rather see a streaming processor there than an FM processor. Because Absolutely. as a rule, you know, they're going to be designed, oh, uh, and, and you know that that was the one that uh, yeah just if you, if you don't do anything else do that and for the love of everything hold yeah on, some dynamic to, range to, in there. to oversimplify the way that HD audio codec is done is think AAC not plus with SBR that that is that is the codec you're working with which is a, a, a decent codec but it's still lossy so yes you do need something that can deal with like you said 36 kilobits on your hd1 is the the minimum you can do right now so right. that's not a lot of bits to make it sound good yeah and i mean now i don't have it here and i'll give a little plug uh barry michigan i saw him in the audience at some point but uh barry has got uh i think tony peterly talking about codex next week so uh definitely that'd be if you get any codec questions throw them out uh, so you go to the bdr.net barry does a weekly lunch gathering and uh, you can sign up for it there it's invitation only and uh, 
you know, on the rare occasion, I might even show up and put my two cents. And speaking in. more to that too, uh, you know, with Tony there and, and, and the Comrex guys and everybody else who makes a, a, a codec, HD, uh, just like any other thing, I'm sure everybody's seen the video of what happens when you take an MP3 and record it several times over and the quality diminishes to almost nothing. Same yep. thing applies here. Cascading codecs will affect the on-air sound, so be careful yep. of that. Right, and up converters are worse because you can't put the bits back after you take them out. Right, um, and I'll get one one last thing on that is clocking. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go back to the clocking. So the the, the old uh, the Lord of the Rings rules applies. Uh, you know, unfortunately, this system was made with two rings, uh, so you have to have clocking. Uh, your HD has to be synchronized in, in, in a clock, and an HD really only wants to run at 44.1. So if you have an old Mosley Starlink running AES across it, it's probably running 32. Uh, yep. That was very common for those. Uh, so what do you need to get yeah. there? Oh, up converter. <laughs> you need an up converter, <laughs> which is uh, on the input of everything, because we all of us manufacturers make sure it goes in at 44.1 to make the codec happy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. You, now you start hearing it. Or even down converting. Uh, if you have an AOIP plant, all of those run at a native 48K. So you still need to sample rate convert that just the so, same. Guys, I'll butt in here for half a second. What's the what's your thoughts on letting the HD multicast just do the sample rate conversion on its inputs and lock them together there? The preferred method, um, because yeah. the card is GPS disciplined. Um, so we yeah. know that the sample rate yeah. converter is ultra stable. So I, I work two ways on that. I mean, using the HDMC with both your audio sources is great, but I'm also running my moneymaker, what 75% of my audience is listening to through yet another computer. And I have paranoia issues about that. At the very least, what I like to see is a dual mode uh, processor, like an 8500 or a Omnia 9, Omnia 11, any FM plus HD, I, as the new Vorsys does that too. I, I try not to pick brands or favorite anybody, but there are a bunch of options. And uh, you can take the 44.1 output from the HD multicast, just run an audio input into it, take the 44.1 output, supply that as the clock to your processor, and that'll clock your analog and your HD one. It's a little bit roundabout, but it'll do the job. So I have a situation where the, uh, the the source, our satellite receivers, will only do 48 kilohertz. So I, I've just found it easier to just clock everything in the rack at 48 and then let the uh, the multicast do the heavy lifting. That's, the, yeah, if you have no other choices, that is the best way to go. Yeah. Now, Eric says, uh, so down converting from 48 should be avoided as well, i.e. studio plant needs to run at 44.1. How much impairment are we talking about? And on a down conversion like that, it'd be pretty minimal. Mm -hmm. That that makes, what, any thoughts on that? It, 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 like you said, you can't add bet, bits back that weren't there in the first place. So if okay. you have to redu bit reduct or bit reduce, bit reduce um, at the last step where you have to, not the entire air chain. Right, um, and by all by the same token, if you do your bit reduction once and don't do it, try to put it back up later, then you're fine, mm -hmm. or more fine. Again, if you have to reduce to 44.1 in the studio air chain and then drop it to 32 to go through an uh, old land link on first generation software, and then up convert it back to 44.1, you're going to create artifacts no matter what you do. Right, so, and that's one of those things. And like I said, uh, you know, the, the AOIP facilities nowadays are 48, so you will have no choice but to do one or the other. Right. So getting out of, and I think we've covered the bulk of what I wanted to cover. Of course, we're already over the top of the hour because I don't think I've finished one of these on time yet, and it'd be a shame to break a perfect record. Um, science project time. Ah, uh, so, yes. This is what Alex gets to play with in his spare time. I don't think he drew that slide, but... Uh, no, nope, Phil did that one. <laughs> anyway, so this is uh, Omnia 9, Enterprise 9S, so software version of the Omnia 9, mm -hmm. uh, loaded onto our... And this is the cool thing about the HD multicast, so I'm going to do a little plug here. Um, so the HD multicast is not an embedded device, and it was purposely designed to be not an embedded device because it's a pretty powerful little computer. Um, and one of the reasons for that is you can do stuff like shove the processing on it, create multiple importer instances, virtualize the whole mess. Um, you can do all kinds of things. So tell me a little bit about what we're looking at here, because 
one of the things that we've seen, and we talked about wonder and delay, of course, I'm going to ask you a question, then I'm going to interrupt and uh, just keep talking. But mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that uh, we run into with the delay is that the delay between the analog and the HD1 does tend to move around a bit. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, the solution has been to solve the symptom by taking a receiver and uh, feeding it back to the uh, measure the uh, difference in delay between the two and then sort of pre-correct the signal going into the exciter by dynamically adjusting the uh, de delay. Right, between you the fix the problem after it happened, yeah. Right, so it's, it a, it, it's a reactive solution for one. The challenge is if the delay for whatever reason gets too far off, then it, it may or may not be it. able to, it may or may not be able to come back, right. So, right. I mean, there's another manufacturer that's got that as a solution. It solves the symptom, so it's better than nothing. Right. Um, I know Innovonics has a, a receiver, the, the Justin 808, that'll do that, and it works pretty well again. They're but, great boxes. But the goal here was to solve the actual problem. So now, right. tell me what we've got. So a year ago, um, and change, when I joined Nautel, I uh, was in Canada there, and uh, was outside, and Phil Schmidt comes walking by and says, oh, look, you're here. Hey, you're coming from my office. I want to show you something. And it was funny because I was having the same conversation not too long before with uh, Frank Foti uh, when I went to Cleveland uh, to visit the Telus guys. And it'd be, wouldn't it be cool if we could just roll it all into one thing and not have this problem at all? So I looked right at Phil and I said, have you been talking to Frank lately? Uh, which in fact, he actually did because they just come back from IBC. Uh, so, and I knew about this. I knew the, the problem wasn't necessarily hard to solve. I just didn't know how to solve it myself. Uh, so the uh, the uh, inspiration here was the correction process was one step too far forward. It needed to go back one place, and that was the audio processor, because that's where the audio splits. Uh, so you've got your you know your your incoming audio for your FM and HD one, and then right before the FM clipper and and, and stereo generator, the HD slices off and keeps going off into its HD world, and the FM keeps going through the rest of it, and you know that that's where that happens. And this is where the problem starts coming into play. It can start moving around. It can shift as it traverses the various paths. Remember, your FM, in a traditional FM, you're going across a LAN link or a MARTI or even an IP codec. It is directly right into the exciter on the composite jack, and you're done. Whereas the HD has got to go through a, a wireless internet provider or a cable, inter, a cable modem and get the internet involved. And everybody says that's a great idea, right? Um, and then several layers of software. Uh, to be encoded and thrown back in, and then it's joined back in in the exciter at the modulation level. So there's a lot of delays, and any one of those things, not necessarily latency, but the jitter thereof, uh, those diverging paths, even if they're on the same length, you can still have diverging paths hmm. uh, just because of the nature of what it's doing. So our goal here was to take the output of the processor, run it all through, a, we call it a shim layer buffer, that time, you know, as it comes out of the processor, it's perfectly in time. So at that point, we make sure that it never moves all the way until it gets to the modulator and then goes out into the transmitter. That way, the problem is solved. Right. Well, um, I mean, and it's over a single pipe. Exactly. So, and that more than anything's the, the, the you know, the, the subtle solution is putting everything on the one pipe. So at the moment, for anybody that's about to ask me for a quote, can't quote it yet, not really a product, but Still a science send, me project. Email, send me an email and tell me to get on Alex and uh, make it a product. And uh, the more of those we get, the faster it becomes one. We hope. And no, you can't use your off-the-shelf uh, Enterprise 9S to do this either. This was a very custom build that Telus built for us. Of course, I had to tweak it. Yep. All right. So on that note, we are about 10 minutes past the top of the hour. This archive, like everything else we do online, will be, or this webinar, like everything else we do online, will be archived. See, this is how I know it's time to stop. I can't talk anymore uh, like that'll ever happen. So definitely there's the resource for our archives. On that note, Alex, I want to thank you very, very much for coming to visit us today. And uh, Shane, I know you're still in the background there. Thank you very much for hopping in with us, as well as uh, Mike Martin from KQAL and uh, everybody attending. 
Thank you all. Have a wonderful week, and we hope to see you next week. And remember, next week we're on Wednesday. I forget what we're talking about, but it'll be on Wednesday. So have a wonderful week, folks. Bye now. Bye-bye.